Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar on setting up a remote learning ecosystem to support remote learning. This webinar is brought to you by trainup.com and Harbinger Interactive Learning. My name is Rahul, and I would be your host for today. I've been joined by a couple of my colleagues, Isha and Rohan, who will help us moderate the session. Now, before we get started with the webinar, let's take a quick look at uh, what are the key takeaways? Uh, what is it that you can expect out of this discussion today? So we'll be presenting to you a framework, a scalable framework through which you can design and implement remote learning solutions. And we'll also be talking about some of the best practices around setting up a remote learning ecosystem. So this will be a 45 minutes webinar. Uh, we have kept aside 10 minutes at the end of the webinar for Q&A and discussion. But at any point of time, if in case you would like to share your thoughts or you have a question, please feel free to type it out in the chat box. We want this to be an interactive session. And with that, now it's time to know our speakers. Our guest speaker for the day is Jeremy Tillman. Good morning, Jeremy. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Good morning. Right. So, uh, Jeremy, uh, you know, for our audience to know you a little better, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, for sure. Well, I'm uh, Jeremy Tillman, founder and CEO at trainup.com and knowledgeful. Super excited to be with you today to share in this. Uh, I've been in L&D, you know, pretty much my entire career. I did a little bit of IT consulting before and uh, started an e-comp company in college, but I, I really have been in the HR and L&D space uh, since uh, 2001. But I always like to start with my why, why I do what I do and why I think learning is so important. You know, for me, learning is near and dear to my heart. Uh, statistically speaking, you know, I probably shouldn't be here today. You know, I'm that kid who grew up in the projects. My parents got divorced very early. Um, my mom struggled with substance abuse. And in our town growing up in public housing, not many African-Americans went to college. And yet somehow, because my mom valued education so much, all of my brothers and sisters went to college. We didn't all graduate, but everyone went. And that was a, a really big achievement. And ever since, you know, I believe that learning is the one thing that can take someone from where they are today to where they want to be tomorrow. And so I've really dedicated my life and, and my career and work to that, empowering growth and, and shaping the future of learning. So uh, this is such an important topic to me, and that, that's why I do what I do. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And yes, of course, uh, you know, you have shared our story with us. And definitely, I think uh, the audience uh, would be very interested in understanding from you in terms of how learning can take you from point A to point B and how you can support the learner in their entire journey. So once again, thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. And uh, now if I may request you to tell us a little bit about your organizations, the organizations, couple of them which you have founded. For sure. And then also, if you want to hear a little bit more about my personal story, you can go to jeremyblogs.com, jeremyblogs.com. That's just a little, little plug. Where are you planning on that? No, so uh, really I have two companies uh, in this space. Trainup.com is our flagship company. I started in 2004. It's a career training marketplace where users can search, research, and register for training. We connect training seekers to training opportunities. And we've had more than 60,000 companies purchase training from us over the years. We've crafted a lot of amazing solutions, mostly around live learning. And KnowledgeFlow is our next-gen uh, talent and learning platform that's really about continuous performance, continuous feedback, and, and continuous learning. And it's really uh, the pause we took to come back and reinvent um, everything that we're doing from, a, from a, a talent tech and a learning tech perspective. We did the traditional LMS systems for big enterprise companies, and uh, we re revamped everything. So excited to talk a little bit about those and really just to get into some of these best practices. Thank you, Jeremy. A training marketplace and a next-gen learning management system solution. So, yep, looking forward to hear more about it. Right, so thank you once again, Jeremy. Uh, now it's time to meet your second speaker for the day. Uh, that's Rahul Me. Uh, I work for Harbinger Interactive Learning. 
Uh, basically, I'm a digital learning enthusiast and over a span of uh, around 15 years of my career, I've been working with organizations and helping them implementing a wide variety of learning solutions to solve business challenges. And now a little bit about Harbinger Interactive Learning. So Harbinger Interactive Learning is a global design and development company specializing in helping organizations migrate their classroom-based trainings into virtual and digital formats. We have over 30 years of experience in delivering innovative learning solutions for various industry verticals. So these were uh, about the introductions. Now, uh, now, Jeremy, let me turn to you and ask you a question. At a very high level, how did a typical learning ecosystem look like during pre-pandemic days? Mm, great question. Well, what's interesting is that learning, especially in the corporate uh, world, has really been the same for a, for a while. I mean, we've been doing this um, synchronously, asynchronously, and, and blended for many years. I mean, and even blended is, is more <laughs> somewhat more recent. But pre-pandemic, the focus was really on a lot of synchronous training. Synchronous training is where you have everyone in the same place at the same time uh, for learning. And so whether that's new hires, the, that's onboarding, whether that's a particular subject, a lot of classroom-based learning, we at TrainUp coordinated hundreds upon hundreds of on-site instructor-led training events at our clients' facilities uh, all, over, all over the globe. And that was a, a pretty traditional model. Asynchronous is where uh, you're connected, whether it's e-learning or, or online or some type of self-paced um, environment. And a lot of learning, especially compliance-based learning and other things take place in that environment. And, you know, both of those create their own kind of interesting, you know, learning silos. When you, when you think about asynchronous learning, we, we know that a user started the course, we know they completed it, maybe we know what their score was, so there's some kind of assessment, but it's really limited to their experience and, and they don't get much interaction with the other learners in the organization. And then blended is where we kind of take an approach to say, let's pull both of those together and let's maybe start with a little bit uh, of online, let's, let's add in some classroom or some synchronous learning in there as well. And, and this was the, the model that pretty much uh, most companies uh, followed pre-pandemic. Right, I would certainly agree to that fact, uh, Jeremy. I think uh, synchronous, asynchronous, and then, uh, you know, a little bit of blend. Uh, and uh, so, so what is it that is, uh, that is compelling us, the L&D leaders, to relook at the uh, existing ecosystem and tweak it a little bit to you know, support the new normal. Yeah. You know, what's happened in, in post-pandemic is really the emergence of remote, um, the remote workforce. And what's, what's really interesting about it is that a lot of the things that needed to change in the current learning ecosystem, the learning silos that were being created, everyone knew those problems existed, but it just wasn't that big precipice for change. Um, it involved new tech, it involved new approaches and, and, and really some commitment on the dollar side to, to make that shift. And a lot of companies weren't, you know, how it goes, it didn't make that commitment. Now that we're, you know, in the middle of this epidemic, there's the emergence of the remote uh, work um, workforce has really eased the burden. I've talked to multiple L&D leaders who told me, Jeremy, I couldn't get my, uh, my people to do this or do that. And now everyone's like, oh, what do we need to do? So there's this kind of feeling of acceptance to change and everyone's open to change now because our whole world has changed and we've been forced into it. But it's created real challenges for L&D leaders. I mean, think about an L&D leader who has traditionally done new hire onboarding and new hire training for 10, 15, 20 years, really the same way in a lot of organizations. For those organizations that are still hiring, that's just not possible to do things the way we did it before. We're onboarding new people now who've never even met. We, the organization has never met them in person. And so it's caused a lot of challenges. And then also we've introduced really new stakeholders. Before it was all about who was the primary champion for the learning initiative, whether it was HR, whether it was a business line, uh, whether it was a leader in the organization uh, or even a manager. And now we have to think um, beyond just those traditional norms. Now we've gotta be really strategic and the remote workforce has brought us to a point where we have to think about 
the actual employee, the actual learner in their environment. Um, I mean, even now, you know, my son and my wife, she thankfully took both of my boys out while I did this webinar or they will be running around. And I think to get someone who can dedicate a significant period of time without interruption in a remote world, um, we've introduced new stakeholders in there. And whether it's community, whether it's family, um, whether it's um, managers and leaders at our organizations, um, the fight for time, it, all of this has created problems where we really have to think about learning in a new way. Uh, can we really get people for eight hours, an all day training event in a virtual environment? You know, so it, it's forced us to have to rethink things. It's created an opportunity for, for change to happen as well. So I think it's an exciting time for learning and a super challenging time at the same time. I think you summarized it very well at the end of it, uh, Jeremy. I think, uh, A, it's exciting. Uh, it's opening up a lot of avenues, opportunities. Uh, it's making people open to accept changes, do things differently, explore. And at the same time, there are challenges. And uh, absolutely, the community as a stakeholder, the definition of stakeholder in our context because of the emergence of this remote workplace has, has changed or has evolved. So thank you very much for giving us this insights in terms of why we as LND leaders need to think of a new learning ecosystem. And we'll get into that in detail in the subsequent uh, slides and in our conversation further. Now, yeah. let's take, take a moment and... Um, yeah, tell, me, tell me maybe some of the... Oh, we got a poll on. Let's, let's, let's do that. Yeah, sure. And, and we'll come back to you after the poll, Jeremy. So, uh, so, you know, this poll is, uh, we just want to get an audience pulse in terms of uh, what the audience feels is, uh, is a key requirement to set up a remote learning ecosystem. And uh, we have multiple options here. Let me run the poll. It should be coming up on your computer screens anytime now. Yeah, it should be up now. And the options are, so the key requirements, the components, is it facilitators? Is it the virtual classrooms, the Adobe Connects, the Zooms, and the Cisco WebEx of the world? Uh, digitization of content, you know, migrating your classroom training programs into a virtual uh, format, digital format. Internet neutrality, because people are, you know, this, it's a distributed workforce working remotely, is internet neutrality a key component? Mm. And other. If you feel there's something else that we need to uh, vote for, uh, please do select that. But the only request that I would make is if you select other, if you could please, you know, kind of uh, type it out in the chat box what you mean by other or what is it one component that you think are components that you think is critical to this entire thing. So we have like 58% uh, people have voted till now. We'll um, give it a few more seconds, probably 10 more seconds. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for actively participating in this. All right, so we'll end the poll now. Okay. All right, so. Um, Right, so there are two winners here as per the audience. One is the facilitators. They are one of the critical components in this entire scheme of things. And the other one is uh, digitization of content. So about 33% of the respondents feel that, you know, facilitators and digitization of con uh, content are two critical components. Uh, virtual classroom, 70%. Interestingly, no one has voted for internet neutrality. That's an that's, that's, uh, interesting perspective. And we have 17% people who have voted for others. So uh, probably I'll just check the chat and see if we have a few comments on the others side. Yeah, so Jeremy, uh, for the other part, I think uh, uh, one of our audience has said that instructional design with engagement top of mind, learner engagement, and mm -hmm. I do that you have some key uh, suggestions and best practices to share with us for uh, learner engagement. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll definitely get into that. That's, that's a huge, huge part of it. I mean, all of these are, are aspects, and it's hard to pick anything that really stands out, but I do uh, agree with if we're not thinking about the engagement level uh, of the learners and how we're going to engage them in this, in this new way, then it, we're going to lose them before we even start. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think now at this stage, it's a good time for us to take a look at the PESE model, the framework for remote learning. Yeah, I'm excited to hear it. I know that Harvard just come up with this, this model and you've been doing this for, for a while. So I'm, I'm stoked to hear a little bit more about it in detail, so. Yes, uh, yeah, so we'll talk about it, Jeremy. In fact, uh, when this COVID thing hit us, uh, what, uh, probably towards the mid of March this year, things started taking a serious turn and people started working remotely and that is where you know, initially there was a lot of uh, uncertainty in terms of how are we going to manage remote workforce? How are we going to train them? How are we going to make sure that we can provide the relevant support needed to our learners? And while working with our customers and you know, talking to the l and leaders, we, we came up with this framework uh, which uh, you know, can help us create, like any other framework would do, can help us create a scalable uh, you know, remote learning solution. So there are four components to this. Prepare, engage, support, evaluate. That's the PESE model. So we'll talk about the prepare part first. And uh, prepare is the starting point. That is where we lay the foundation of success of the learning program. Uh, there are multiple things in it. Uh, to start with, it is important for us to agree upon the specific business challenge that we are solving. So like one of the examples that you mentioned, let's say if you're onboarding new employees and they do not come to the office physically, they haven't met their peers, supervisors, managers, leaders in person, and they're just showing up on Zoom meetings and you know, uh, uh, they are performing their job roles and tasks. How easy or difficult it is to ensure that the culture of the organization is imbibed in this new hires and they can be provided the relevant support to get it ready for you know, their job. So what is the business challenge that we are solving? The second one is knowing your audience. You have to understand what type of audience you're dealing with. One size doesn't fit all. That's what we are suggesting. Uh, the type of learning modalities. Now remote learning is not about you know, taking content and digitizing it and creating into e-learning solutions. It could be various things, it could be a virtual live virtual instructor-led training session. It could be, sometimes it could just be a blog or an interactive PDF that needs to be pushed out as a you know, reinforcement learning material. So think about the learning modalities, the instructional design piece. And then evaluate or take a call in terms of what role that you want the technology to play. Assess you have the relevant technology in-house or you would want some additional support to implement your remote learning program successfully. And then the role of your virtual instructors. Do you have virtual instructors? Do you have that capability in-house? Or do you need to upskill your instructors who were earlier delivering in a classroom environment, now how to deliver in a virtual environment? So prepare is about business challenge, knowing your audience, type of learning modalities, role of technology, and role of virtual instructors. Now comes the second pillar, engage, uh, the learner engagement. It's an absolute necessity. As you said that, you know, is it possible to have someone sit in a virtual instructor-led training session for eight hours? I mean, in, in classrooms, we have done this pre-pandemic, but uh, in virtual environments, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not possible. So you have to do things differently to keep the learner engaged. And, and, and when we'll get back, uh, when we'll get to Jeremy to know about some of the best practices, we'll be talking more in detail about all these four components. Moving ahead to the third component, the third pillar of our framework, that's support. So it's not about delivering a session on a Zoom or you know, just assigning an e-learning program to particular individuals and thinking that the job is done. It's a continuous process. The learning is a continuous process and you have to ensure we have to ensure that the learning is available in the flow of work for the learners. So that's about the support angle of it. 
and then evaluate. Lastly, we need to evaluate what is the impact and the effectiveness of the learning. No matter how good learning solutions or learning technology we put together in place to set up this learning ecosystem, but if the business objectives are not being met or uh, the learners are not progressing in their learning journey, then we need to step back, really look at the situation, evaluate, do course correction, and then you know, roll it out again. So this is the uh, remote learning framework, uh, Jordan, the PESE model. Oh, that's great. Tell me some examples of where you had some success um, in applying this for some of your, your customers. In... Right. So in terms of, uh, you know, there was this medical device company for which we created uh, a, a remote learning program. And uh, the business case was these, uh, you know, sales representatives who work in this medical device company need to sit across the table with clinicians and physicians and explain them the features and benefits of a medical device, the product. Now, this organization wanted to transition to a solution-based organization rather than a product-based organization. And that was an organization-wide initiative. And while they were planning out this initiative, COVID hit. Mm -hmm. So everything went remote. So what we did was we worked together collaboratively with this customer of ours, and we created a remote learning program which had various components. It had virtual instructional training sessions. It had... Uh, uh, you know, standard e-learning, it had game-based component. One of the components in that particular program was to enable the medical device sales representative feel as to what it means to, you know, be in the patient's shoes, mm. uh, you know, for the particular disease for which they were, you know, kind of positioning this medical device. So we created a game-based uh, digital learning environment for them, wherein they were actually able to experience what a patient with a particular uh, condition has to go through so that they could feel and connect with the problems of the patient and then present this uh, solution or position this medical device product to the clinicians and physicians accordingly. So that's where uh, you know, we've, we've seen some sort of success there. So that's one example uh, that came to my mind. That's great. Um, it makes it makes great sense. And you really need all these steps in order to have that outcome. You know, you have to understand what success looks like. So I love that. Right. Right. So uh, we, we looked at the PESE model. Uh, now, Jeremy, I think the audience would like to know your thoughts around the best practices that you would suggest for L&D leaders while they embark on the journey of uh, setting up a learning ecosystem to support remote learning. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a request to you, Jeremy, that, you know, when you share those best practices, if you could please, uh, you know, share the best practices under the four pillars of the PESE model. So, for example, to begin with, what are your recommendations under the prepare component? What are your thoughts around that? It's great. No, I mean, I, it actually, some of the best, the best practices that I outlined really do fit this model um, as well. And I think we'll start with prepare. I think one of the things that's so critical when you think about, you know, preparing, and like I said, we all we do is coordinate training uh, for organizations. So this is what we do on a day in and day out basis. And you'd be surprised at how many times we don't start with the end in mind. Organizations don't really start with the end in mind and really defining success uh, before you ever begin the training initiative. It has to start early. You have to think early about what does success look like? The change that we want as a result of the training if we're actually doing that, if these things are, uh, are put into practice, what will our organization look like? How will we measure that? Um, thinking about these things early on in the process is really uh, a big part of the, the preparation phase and that we, that we think is important. And then, and then also, I mean, this goes without saying, I mean, I hate to even mention it. It's like almost like, you know, forgot password. You always have to test your tech too. Whatever, whatever tech you're doing, especially in this re remote force, you don't want uh, that training to start off on, on, the, on a bad foot. So you definitely want to uh, test your tech before you prepare. And, but one of the things that's, that's so important about um, preparation, if we're going to build engagement in, 
if we are going to uh, have this training look, feel, act differently to get to the outcomes that we want, we, it starts at that preparation phase. Back before you know, the pandemic, it would be, hey, a need has arisen. We know we need to get someone trained in this particular area. And you just go off, hire a company or go internally and get something put together and we just roll it out. And those type of solutions just aren't having the type of end results that clients want uh, along, along the way. And if you prepare um, more in advance, then what happens is that you uncover um, things that are going to help shape that learning and shape your solution uh, a lot better. So, totally. Right. And then, in, yeah. uh, no, I was just saying that, you know, I totally agree with you in terms of uh, you have to prepare with the end goal in the mind. You can't be midway and then we let, oh, okay where do we want to reach? So uh, thank you very much for sharing those thoughts. So uh, now we'll move on to the second component. So engagement, you know, it's, it's a key thing. So what, what would you uh, suggest there? Yeah, and, and to engage, I mean, we think it's important to engage early. So, um, and to make it personal, but you've, you've got to get the engagement going early. A lot of times pre-pandemic, literally people will get signed up for learning in the LMS or they would sign themselves up in the LMS and their engagement would start when they got to the class or when they had to take that course. And what that doesn't do is it doesn't stoke any curiosity. If we want to keep our users engaged, we have to start engaging them before they actually get to uh, whatever that formalization of the training actually is. Do things as simple as ask the learners uh, what they expect to get out of it. A lot of times we don't engage with the, with the learners and even ask them what they're expecting to learn. And so because we're, you know, we have this idea of making it personal, we're in such a digital age, we could simply have people grab their phones and record a one minute video of what they're expecting to learn in this training. And that insight goes a long way. Not only does it help the instructor prepare, imagine having 20 people in your, in your learning uh, environment and having all 20 of those people, or even 15 of them, telling the instructor what their expectations were in that, you, well before the training. You could really then craft based on those expectations. And then the learners themselves can feed off of the, those, those short one minute videos as their colleagues are also uh, sharing and engaging and you started uh, this process you made it personal they're getting a share they know they expect to learn they're going with an appetite for learning instead of uh, just showing up and hoping that they learn something so engaging early and throughout that process where we get the best engagement when there's a requirement on the other side, where there is something at stake for the, for the user. And like you said, for the medical device company, you made a, a little bit of a, a gamification aspect of it to put them in the shoes of the, of the user. We need to stoke our learners' curiosity before they get to learning and, and throughout, if we want them really actively engaged. And this is even more important in, in the uh, remote workforce times because it's a battle for our attention. It's a constant battle for our attention. And we've seen early on as companies shifted very quickly that a lot of times people are trying to do other things while they're in quote unquote a learning process because maybe they're bored during a section or maybe it's, they don't really feel like it's for them because they weren't really committed early. No, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you there. It's, uh, it's a battle of attention. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk that has already started about Zoom fatigue. So when it started initially, uh, we, were, we were good with it, right? We, we enjoyed getting on the Zoom, putting on the video and taking the calls. But now this, uh, you know, if it's, if it's not engaging enough, if, uh, if the learner doesn't feel that they are kind of a stakeholder in it, uh, they might just lose interest. And uh, engaging early, uh, uh, sometimes I feel like it's, it's like the Netflix uh, kind of uh, thing wherein you, you do some teasers uh, of uh, the actual stuff that you're going to talk about in the training and learning scenarios and generate curiosity amongst learners. So, you know, kind of putting together a few teaser videos about your learning solutions and all. And I think uh, what uh, all of us would benefit over here is one of the suggestions that you gave is 
what if if we ask the class let's say if it's a for a, if it's a virtual class that we are conducting for 15 or 20 or people and we just say that you know cut a video and give us what do you expect to learn out of us and then if we kind of build that into the program uh, that would just make it so much more engaging and everyone would participate and uh, so that's that's a very useful tip that I will I will definitely take away as uh, as a key thing from this discussion today, Jeremy. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. So uh, from the engagement part, now we move to the support part, Jeremy. So in terms of the continuous learning, uh, when when learners are not when when learners are working remotely and they do not have access to the relevant resources or the relevant people. At, uh, at, a, at the point of need, what do they do? How do we support them with the continuous learning? Yeah, I mean, it's such a great point uh, when we think about the ongoing nature of learning. If we think about how we actually learn, we realize that the knowledge and the information that we're gonna present them during the core training, that knowledge and information alone by itself is not enough to produce the highest level of change that we desire. I mean, even this webinar, we're going to lay out some great best practices. The question becomes, what do we do next? How do we put it into practice? And then how do we support the ongoing learning? And our thought is that you have to come up to the table with a continuous mindset. You have to come to the table understanding that you're not going to get it all figured out in the first day. I mean, do we become great leaders because we go to a, a leadership course, a one day leadership course? Of course not. I mean, we, how do we become great leaders? Well, over time, observation, putting things into practice. And so are we setting up our learning environments with the continuous methodology in mind? Are we setting up our learning environments to really support the ongoing learning after? And so, especially now that we're in this remote environment, we believe it's critically important to align digital assets uh, and other follow on training at the beginning. So as you're preparing for this learning, it's not just about getting the greatest facilitator or the greatest instructor or even creating the, the, the greatest just in time moment. It's what do we do next? What do we do af afterwards? And how do we learn from what we're learning and then improve that and, and add it back in? And so continuous learning is the recognition that to really put these things into practice, we're going to have to continue, uh, continue that. And so it, it takes a, a real uh, effort to think about it, but it's it's so important um, that we that we do it. And I mean, even let's think programmers, software training. Um, I mean, you're not going to become a great programmer after your five days of, of a programming course. Or let's take something like DNI, which is really important right now. I mean, if we did if we rolled out content for diversity and inclusion or unconscious bias, that I mean, great content, great information. But what are we doing to support the continued conversation and the change that we actually want in our organizations? And so it's really important. And we're really encouraging companies to think about how they set up those communities, those environments well before um, the training starts so that we can support um, that continuous learning effort and really approaching it with the continuous first mindset. Right. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, so in terms of the continuous learning, uh, are you gonna talk a little bit about the training flow, the next-gen learning management solution, which can support some of uh, this type of continuous learning that we are talking about? Sure, yeah, absolutely. You know, so I think these things, all, all of these things that we're thinking about, all these concepts were really drivers that we've been thinking about even pre-COVID um, and, and, and the pandemic, we've been really thinking about these things at Triumph.com for a while. Uh, what's funny is that, uh, so we have this, we have this uh, training flow platform that we've been working on developing. And you might even, I don't know, maybe we even have a, a slide there uh, for it, um, which we'll, we'll get to. Um, yeah, here we go. So at, at, at Train Up, when we, when we think about training flow, what we've really done is we've really reimagined kind of the way we learn. You know, we're taking some of these best practices. What we recognize in the corporate learning is that it's very siloed. Um, if HR requires you to take a course, 
you know that someone started it, finished it, and what their score was. And that's a siloed learning experience. And even in our classrooms, sometimes we create these, these siloed learning experiences. And so what we did is we took a step back and we analyzed how humans learn. We analyzed the, the, all these various aspects of continuous learning to come up with this training flow uh, model. And what's cool about it is that as, as soon as you know, this kind of pandemic hit, we realized that the things we're working on are so important to right now helping uh, companies make this shift and setting up an ecosystem and the tech part of it. I mean, all these best practices that we're giving you, you can put it into practice without any technology, without training flow. We just, we're trying to make it easier uh, in our platform to get to some of the communal things, which we'll talk about you know, community in a minute, because I think it's, it's a critical aspect of this. And it's really the, the core of everything that we're doing, um, even at, at training flow. And you can go to the, on the next slide there. One of the core aspects of it, and I'll just point it out, is, is this methodology we developed around continuous learning that, that really says that the learning shouldn't stop when the training does. And so we take this pre-course uh, approach where we develop community um, prior to the learning. Um, we have this in-class interactivity and community that we're building in the class and with that particular cohort. And then post the is really where the system comes to life and the concepts come to life because that's where the continuous learning happens. And let me give you just one quick example of why this is important and why, kind of how we did it, I wouldn't even say pre-pandemic, how we've been doing it for years at Train Up and how organizations have been doing it and why we think this is so important. So uh, a, year and a, a year and a half ago, we get a call from a big client, big global company and they wanted to do one day of design thinking and one day of critical thinking and problem solving training, a request we often get. And in the past, based on the old model, what we would do is we would source a world-class instructor. I mean, the top companies want the best talent. So we're gonna source a, a world-class instructor on design thinking and critical thinking and problem solving, maybe even two. Flying down to the client site, they're gonna deliver an amazing day of training. And then they're gonna be off working with another client. And we're gonna leave that client with great knowledge and insights in that one day, but then what? And my team and I were just tired of sourcing great instructors, delivering you know, great customized material, but then leaving. And this particular um, request that we got really sparked something in us and really led to some of the concepts around training flow. This organization was bringing in 20 high potentials from all over the, actually 20, you know, 20 or 30 high potentials from 20 different countries actually, all into one um, two-day on-site event. And we thought, wow, what's gonna happen the first day of class when, 20, when 30 people from 20 different countries get together for the first time? They all work at the same company, but they haven't met each other. They don't really know each other. They even work in the same function within that company and really haven't met. And so it's gonna be tough. So what, what we do in training flow methodology is that we actually build that pre-community and we allow those 30 people to upload a one minute video of them introducing themselves and just telling one unique thing about themselves. And what that does is that it allows everyone to realize that I'm not the only one with an accent. Little cultural things like that are so important and we can solve some of those problems in the actual pre-community. And also design thinking, these are big concepts. The first time we hear information is the time we retain the least. So why would we wait till we get to the classroom to introduce core concepts? So what we do in that pre-community is we're introducing the core concepts of design thinking before the student actually ever gets to the actual formalized learning. That way, when they hear it again, it reinforces something they've already worked on. And so we create small micro learning around each of the core concepts around design thinking, that iteration step or whatever that might be, for instance. And all this happens in the pre-community before you ever get there. Then when people get to the actual in-person, whether it's virtual live or actually in a classroom, it's not, hey, I'm Jeremy meeting you for the first time. It's hello, so-and-so, oh, I saw your video. Yeah, oh, so you like that too, oh yeah. And, and those are the things that we can do. And then afterwards, we have assignments and activities and other things that they're gonna do that are required of them. So if we wait and we hold that completion certificate, and so people have actually interacted in the post community, we're gonna get a lot more progress because people want to complete things. So make your post training a part of the completion, a part of the training process, instead of saying that it's complete once the actual formalized class ends. Make the post part of that. 
um, that, that process. In those assignments and that follow-on learning that we want them to engage in afterwards when they can actually put it into practice. And then of course in the platform we have a new way of evaluating where you can leave acknowledgments and encouragements throughout the process. So we start the evaluation early in the first phase and pre, you start evaluating content and other things that are happening and you start interacting and engaging and sharing your stories well, be well before so that when it comes to the end, you're already used to those processes and methodologies. And so it's a, you know, Training Flow is an interactive platform to support learning, not just remote learning, but, but all learning. So excited about that. You can check more out at knowledgeflow.com, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it, we'll keep it rolling and get, and get back to your, back to your model. Right. No, uh, thank you very much, Jeremy. I think uh, this is, this is one of the critical things uh, which you spoke about. And, and the good thing is that you have been doing this pre-pandemic. And what we realized when the, you know, we were, you know, kind of uh, putting our minds together in terms of the best possible solution to solve the remote learning needs, we realized that, you know, a training program, and of course we were not biased by, uh, you know, uh, this particular concept of yours. Of course we knew it, we had heard it from you before that as well, but we realized that, you know, there are three parts of this, let's say a virtual instructor-led training session, before the session, during the session, after the session. And it ties so well, pre-course community, pre-session community, during the session community, and post-session community. And there are certain, you're creating subtle engagement points for the learners. You're creating a community. So we spoke about community as a key stakeholder. And uh, I think the, this is very valuable. And then the support piece. So during the you know post-course community is you're providing support once the session has been delivered. So the continuous learning piece. So. Uh, this is very interesting. And uh, could you just briefly talk about a little bit about how do users promote content in this community? The, uh, you know, for example, let's say there are, there could be multiple learning materials on, let's say a topic like unconscious bias. But uh, how do I, as a learner, when I get into the system, what is it that would trigger me that, you know, this is the best blog or this is the best micro learning nugget that I should read about unconscious bias? No, that's a great, great question. So one of the things that we think when we think about learning in this new ecosystem, and like you said earlier, it's not just about the formal content. The informal content plays a critical role in our learning. And whether that's blogs that we find on the internet or whether that's resources or documents that we upload. But one of the things that we also value inside of knowledge flow and our training flow environment is the accountability of the content. So in our platform, every piece of content is added, every blog post is added, every resource is added. Users who are experiencing that content get the ability to acknowledge or encourage. It's a way of giving continuous and real-time feedback on the actual content. So as content is more acknowledged, it kind of bubbles up and it becomes more readily available because it's having a measurable impact and users are saying, yeah, this content is really aligning. And so it's kind of this own self-policing, self-rating system that happens inside the platform. And it allows L&D to know what content is really moving and having an impact or what content is being encouraged and, and users have to actually leave a feedback as to why they encourage that particular content or article because uh, we want that dialogue. We want that debate around these concepts because that is what brings the engagement and people want their voices to be heard. And so we give you the ability for your voice to be heard in a specific way aligned to learning and those learning goals. And so it's this constant um, evaluation and, and promotion that happens in the platform. Right, and thank you. Thank you very much for explaining that. I think one of the key things that the LD leaders can take is what content is getting the most traction from the users? I think that's one question that keeps popping up again and again. So if there's a system which is enabled by technology through which we can get insights into this, that would be very helpful. All right, so uh, moving ahead. So we are now time for the second poll. And uh, so what we are going to ask the audience is, uh, is there a consistent demand from the project sponsors for a clear return on investment? And I can already see, you know, some people smiling while attending this show. Anyways, I'll uh, run this poll. It should be coming up on your screen now. 
So uh, you don't, do not have too many options for this. It's either yes, no, or not sure. So you should have it on your screen now. Okay, so uh, people have started voting for it. Thank you very much for the active participation. 68% um, people have voted till now. So we'll just keep it open for another five to seven seconds. All right, so we are almost 90% votes we have got. So we'll end the polling. All right, so it's a clear winner. 100% uh, people say that, you know, the project sponsors require a clear return on investment. And that brings us to our last point. And one of the critical points is how do we evaluate this? So we have been talking about implementing or creating a learning ecosystem to support learning needs, to support remote learning. But how do we evaluate this and how do we put together a case of return on investment for our sponsors? I can take that for, for sure. Uh, I, I think, you know, for us, we tie ROI and evaluation together. Uh, we think it's critically important to already be thinking, as we mentioned earlier, with the ability to get feedback throughout the process. Uh, ROI is, a, is an ongoing thing. And when we look at this, one of the things we do in training flows, we allow users to share their stories of success and learning impact. So we call them learning applied. So we want to know how are people applying the learning concepts in their actual jobs or how they're struggling to apply those concepts. So let's say that you're learning about design thinking and you get to a step where you're supposed to iterate and you're having a hard time or your team's giving you pushback. You can go into the learning community and say, I'm getting pushback on this and others can give you uh, input. And that's how we actually learn together as well. When you talk about this community-based learning, we learn together because the people who went through that training with us and the leaders in our organization can, can provide that kind of story. But when we actually apply that learning successfully, and it impacts a project and we share that story, that's how we really understand ROI. So here's a story of um, how you learned a particular uh, feature in let's say Final Cut Pro and you had a, a short deadline for a client and because you learned that feature, you were able to deliver that video clip in Final Cut Pro on, on time and you know you wouldn't have had the skill set to do it if it wasn't for the training. You can highlight that story of impact and we can tie that specifically to a project outcome in the, in the organization. And the collective of all the learners sharing those stories of impact give you a, a really different measure of ROI that you can tie directly back to projects. And it's more important, we think, than just saying, yes, I like the training or yes, I found the training effective. Well, how was it effective? These stories of learning applied give you that and they also build into the engagement um, and continuous learning experience as well. Right, and thank you. Thank you for sharing this insights. I think uh, it's an interesting perspective, Jeremy, to be honest, uh, because uh, when I've been speaking to L&D leaders, uh, mostly people have come back and said that data. But uh, I, I agree with you to a certain aspect is that even the smallest of the wins these success stories, these need to be promoted. And especially when it's, you know, about these learning communities that we are talking about. So what if, if, you know, this particular individual or learner, you know, completed this learning journey and this is how it is impacting on his or her job. Uh, these kind of stories would also create an impact and maybe, uh, you know, give an ROI to our project sponsors. Very good. Well, we don't want to take away the data. So we, we, we come alongside your other evaluation methods that you have within your organization, but we want to take it a step beyond and push and challenge that sometimes the clearest data doesn't, doesn't come from the traditional sources. So it's always good to have a healthy debate. Absolutely. And, and that's a vast topic where we can go on for hours and, you know, probably have a separate conversation there. So but thank you, thank you, Jeremy. I think uh, these were some of the uh, you know, very insightful ideas, especially around the learning engagement piece, involving the learner, those one minute videos, creating those communities, pre-community, post-community, how to effectively use it. And irrespective of the tech, that's the beauty. Uh, what you spoke to us about is the fundamental philosophy that you believe in. And then tech is, a supporting role or digitization of content or the different type of learning modalities, they play a supporting role. Right, so now we open up for discussion. 
So we'll request our audience to uh, please feel free to share your thoughts, questions, comments, anything that you agree to, disagree to, please feel free. You can use the Q&A box or you can use the chat box. We'll take turns and you know, we'll answer the questions for you. So let me monitor the chat and uh, let me see Jeremy if we have some questions. So there is one question coming here is, uh, is that is training flow another component in the existing learning ecosystem, will it add up to the complexities or can it be kind of integrated within the an existing learning ecosystem and talk to other systems? Mm. Well, that's a great question. I get this, I get this often. Uh, I was actually at a, in an office in London of a, of a global company and they said, look, we, we're very committed to our learning management system platform. We don't want to add another thing on top of um, or replace anything. And you know, from that discussion, that was about three years ago, we knew that we would have to build training flow in such a way that it could work with existing systems and not have to replace systems. So you don't have to replace your LMS user product. In fact, you can use training flow for one learning initiative. You don't even have to use it for every learning initiative. So the client I gave you an example, that one on-site training, we can set up communities for that one initiative or for one special e-learning initiative or um, one special you know, leadership development program at your company. And it just works with your existing tech and it comes right alongside it and, and integrates in. Uh, or, you know, obviously we have the capacity to do bigger initiatives uh, as well. So a very good question though. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for asking that. All right, so, uh, so let me take this opportunity while we hang out here for another five to seven minutes. Let me take this opportunity to thank you, Jeremy. And uh, this was absolutely a wonderful discussion. And uh, there's, there's so much to talk about. I'm, I'm just getting the feeling that, you know, one session is not enough. You know, probably we'll have to do this in multiple parts or multiple episodes. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you everyone who took the time out to attend this uh, event. I hope, we hope you enjoyed this discussion, this conversation. If you have any questions uh, for the team at Harbinger, please do drop us a line at info at harbingerlearning.com. And uh, if you have any questions to Jeremy, please feel free to drop him a line at uh, jtillman at knowledgeflow.com. I think our colleagues would have uh, posted the email IDs in the chat box. You can use it from there. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy, for this insightful discussion. Thanks. Appreciate it. So we'll just hang around for another few minutes and we'll, I'll monitor the chat if there's any more questions for us to answer. Okay, there is a question. And uh, Jeremy, I would request you to take this. All right. Uh, the question says, what might be an efficient or effective way to capture whether business objectives are messed? Uh, would it be post course community service? So what's an effective way to capture if business objectives are missed? Are met. Met, ah, oh, yes, are met. Well, I, I think it's a great question. If you start with the end in mind and you understand the kind of change and impact that you want, what you, what you wanna do is you should know your audience as to where, where they are, and you can, you can really look at evaluating. So I'm gonna give you two, uh, two examples. Let's say that it's a, a leadership initiative. These are very, leadership is very hard to measure, you know? Um, and when we do leadership, we ask organizations to say, okay, where are the areas of impact that you want? Is it in stand-up meetings? Is it in what areas of leadership do you really want to impact? But one of the things that you can, you can evaluate is ask the people who are being um, led what type of change they've seen in their leaders over time. Now you can formalize that with, with a pre-leadership survey of those um, users and then a, a post leadership survey after. There's a lot of different ways to, to do that. Sometimes we're doing training where, where things are just 
a little bit more measurable. So when it's software or it's tools or it's using Excel, those are things that are easily more measurable um, for productivity afterwards. But again, if we don't set up um, those evaluation metrics prior to the training and make uh, the students aware or the stakeholders or um, the, the peers aware that there's this evaluation that needs to happen or the conversation that needs to happen, then it's gonna be really difficult to measure it afterwards if you don't think about it um, before. Right, thank you. So I think uh, what you said is uh, putting the evaluation metrics prior to the outcome of the training. So that, that's one key thing, great. There's just one comment, Jeremy, or wherein uh, one of our audience has said that, you know, that concept of uh, asking the learners to record the expectations in terms of what they want to achieve out of this particular training session, uh, that's interesting. And it says that it adds the social element back into the training, or the, which is lost with remote learning. I think that, that's an impactful statement, the social element, tying it back into the learning or the training program because it is getting lost with the remote learning. I mean, I 100% agree. And I think even, you know, pre-pandemic, we just, we didn't do a great enough job of engaging our learners in a way, I mean, hey, social works. It works in these platforms for a reason. We've struggled to bring those techniques into uh, our corporate environment because of the fear of openness. Well, in our platform, you're, nothing's really open. It's very closed. So if users are responding to really smartly, well-designed questions and, and action opportunities, where they get to be personal and do it in a social manner or in a manner that's very similar than they're already doing it on Instagram or Tiki Talk or whatever people are using, it, it brings that back, it brings the element of fun and it brings the social where you're, you're looking and viewing others' comments and their videos and it, it brings the accountability and it, and it lowers the barrier of entry as well. And so I think you'll get a higher response rate than just sending out like a survey monkey or something like that. I, I totally agree with that. So yep, uh, we are almost at the top of the hour, Jeremy. So let me thank you once again on behalf of Harbinger Group. Thank you very much for taking the time out for this discussion. This was absolutely a very insightful conversation, a lot of key takeaways, and I feel the audience would have also enjoyed it. Thank you. Great, thanks, it's been a pleasure, appreciate it. Thank you, bye, take care. Thanks.